Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Regional Transportation Committee. Um, this is our meeting for Tuesday, February 15th, 2022. I'm Ashley Stolzman, the Denver Regional Council of Governments Chair and the Chair of this committee, and I'll call the meeting to order. Ask if there are any members of the public that would care to comment this morning. Seeing none, that takes us um, just to notice that as attachment A in our packet, we have the January 18th RTC meeting summary. Any comments on the meeting summary from folks? If not, we can accept them as presented. All right, we will accept those. And that takes us to our first action item this morning. Our first action item is amending the FY 2022 to 2023 Unified Planning Work Program. And Josh Swank, our assistant planner, is going to tell us about that. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. Um, let me get the memo up on your screen. So just as a recap for all of you, the uh, Unified Planning Work Program is a document which details all of the federally funded transportation planning activities, which will be conducted within our region over a two year period. Um, this document is federally required, uh, which means that its contents are shaped by federal law and regulations. Our current UPWP uh, was adopted by the Board of Directors in July of last year and covers federal fiscal years 2022 and 23. Recently, several changes have been made at the federal and state levels, which uh, require some changes to be made on our UPWP. So these include November of last year, uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IIJA, or sometimes called the Bill, uh, was signed into law replacing the FAST Act. Um, also, December 30th of last year, the U.S. Department of Transportation released a set of eight new planning emphasis areas, uh, and these really just align MPO activities with uh, national goals and priorities. Um, finally, on the state level, SB 260 um, and the new GHG rule require some new staff activities as well. So given all of these changes, staff is proposing amending our UPWP to align the tasks in the document with our new regulatory environment. Um, so I'll run through some of the major changes included in the doc or in the amendment. Uh, the first is to the federal transportation planning factors. So these are a set of 10 areas which must be considered by MPOs as part of our planning process. Um, the IIJA mostly just carried these over word for word from the FAST Act, but there was one change which was to add the word housing into planning factor five. Uh, so MPOs are now required to consider projects and strategies that promote consistency between transportation improvements and housing. So to meet that requirement, we've added a task to consult with housing agencies to incorporate housing into our transportation planning process. Other major tasks that were added related to IIJA uh, include working with the state to develop a carbon reduction strategy, identifying and prioritizing potential projects for new federal grant programs, such as uh, congestion relief, healthy streets, reconnecting communities, Safe Streets and Roads for All, and the Smart Technology Grants, um, as well as reviewing and potentially updating our critical urban freight corridors in the region. Um, additionally, um, we have our eight new planning emphasis areas to consider. Staff is already engaged in many activities around those, um, so not a lot of changes were needed, but we have added additional coordination tasks in order to meet the intent of emphasis area five, uh, which is Strategic Highway Network and U.S. Department of Defense Coordination, as well as Planning Emphasis Area 6, which is Federal Land Management Agency Coordination. Finally, we've added prioritizing opportunities um, to reduce on-road carbon dioxide emissions related to the new state GHG rule. Um, so happy to take any questions about any of that. Um, otherwise, I do have a proposed motion available for you on your screen. Thank you. Um, Director Levy. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Stolzman, uh, and thanks for the presentation. Um, I just, I had just, well, one uh, question and, a, and a, well, I don't know, whatever, two comments to make here, whatever we're going to call them. Um, first, it may seem kind of minor, but in the um, list of acronyms, we acronym glossary, you have, uh, and maybe this is just standard, but BIL, bipartisan infrastructure law, um, where as I guess this is uh, part of the uh, impetus for this is the infrastructure 
and Jobs Act, the uh, well, there's an official I, name for it. So I, 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 IJA. Yeah, I, IJA. I guess <laughs> I wonder why we use both because it's the same thing. And, um, you know, we don't need, we've got three pages of acronyms. <laughs> Do we need another uh, acronym here when we've got an official name? But the more important question really is just to, to flesh out and help me understand what what we mean when we say we're going to incorporate housing in our transportation planning. Like we just say it as if we all know what that means. And I, from reading this, I don't know what that means. And particularly uh, the reference to um, consulting housing agencies in that planning. Um, that's a small part if you're referring to housing authorities or nonprofit housing providers like Mercy um, Housing. It's, it's a small part of uh, housing. So I'm just wondering what we actually mean. What would it look like to consider housing in our transportation planning process? Josh, thank you. Sure. Um, so to your first question, um, I think that's that's a frustration that many of us also share. Um, you're, you're correct that the official name is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IIJA, um, but much of the guidance coming out of uh, the Federal Highway Administration right now is using the bipartisan infrastructure law as their sort of preferred terminology. Um, so within the document at this time, we are we are solely reference, referencing IIJA, but wanted to include the BIL or bill in the acronym glossary, just in case um, people are familiar with that terminology that that is included in there, um, in case we do move in that direction, if that's what we hear from our federal partners in the future that they uh, that they prefer for us to use. Um, to your second uh, point, um, for for housing, I think the language that we've included in the document right now is um, May, maybe purposefully a little bit vague um, because we're still trying to figure out for ourselves also what that means and what that looks like. Um, so we do have that new requirement that it be taken into consideration that we consider um, housing and more things on the land use side as we are uh, going about our transportation planning process. Um, so right now what, what has been added is really um, reaching out to agencies that are involved with housing around the region and figuring out what that looks like. And then in the future, hopefully being able to uh, nail down some more concrete terminology in terms of what we will actually do around that. Um, but right now we just wanted to make sure that that was in the document so that we could begin that work, um, reaching out to those agencies, starting those discussions and seeing what that looks like in the future. Director Levy? Um, yeah, thank you. So I think what I what I hear is that uh, the amendment or the the new two year plan will meet the letter of the law because we say we're going to incorporate housing, but we actually don't know what that means and we don't know how we're going to do it. And so I will I'll leave it at that and I look forward to um, to understanding that better. And, um, and, you know, just on the first point, I, I, I get it. There's some messaging going on around referring to it as the bipartisan infrastructure law, because we definitely want everybody to remember that it was bipartisan, but I just worry about confusion. You know, what is the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act versus that? But, you know, that, that's a minor point. I, I do look forward to understanding how incorporating housing into the metropolitan planning process will actually look. Thank you very much, Director Levy. Um, Director Papstorf? Um, thank you. I, I had not I had some different comments, which, which I'll make, but I did want to, um, Madam Chair, address um, Director, uh, Director Levy's comments, because um, Josh is absolutely correct. We don't, we don't fully know exactly what changes we might make to sort of uh, fully incorporate uh, this new housing provision into our transportation planning process. But it's also true that we have always incorporated housing into our transportation planning process at some level. This is, this is a little bit more of a uh, uh, federal sort of formalization of that and our effort to formalize that. But I think the, the real key here is looking at our transportation planning, our investment strategies and priorities, 
and trying to take steps to, to more directly link those to our regional housing um, goals in a more formal way. But um, I, I think it would be um, a mischaracterization to think that we've um, not ever considered housing in our transportation planning process before. This is a bit more of a formalization and a recognition, I think, at the federal level of the need to do that um, and why that has been added to, to the planning factor, um, of which there are several that, that we always comply with. Um, my, my other comment that I wanted to make um, was that um, Josh really did a, an excellent job of explaining sort of the genesis of a lot of these changes, but I also wanted to inform the RTC that along with sort of some of these new efforts um, and, and as a way to comply with or achieve new goals or objectives from the federal infrastructure law and from Senate Bill 260, um, the federal infrastructure law, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act or the bill, um, are providing us as an MPO additional planning resources um, through um, planning funds, uh, through FHWA and FTA to help us accomplish this work. So part of the UPWP amendment um, also sort of acknowledges those additional uh, resources and we'll be beefing up uh, our, our internal resources and some consulting assistance to assist us with this additional work. So I didn't want the committee walking away this morning thinking that we're just adding all this work and we don't have the, we won't have the resources to actually do it. We are getting some additional resources through the federal infrastructure bill to assist us with this work. Thank you very much, um, Director Papstrup. Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Stolzman. Uh, Director Levy actually directly uh, hit the nail on the head with with what my question was going to be. Let me uh, let me see if I can hammer it in a little a little uh, farther, uh, Ron or Josh. How in the past have we um, incorporated a housing analysis into our planning? And I'm not asking for a detailed answer right now. But I think what I'm suggesting, maybe, uh, maybe Doug, is uh, that at, at a future workshop uh, uh, meeting, we could um, maybe have a, a briefing on how that has been done in the past and maybe a, a case study, a couple instances where we have incorporated housing. What I'd like to know, uh, Ron or Josh, is do we think that this new uh, federal guidance will uh, result in us having a similar process as to what we've done before, which is why it's even more essential that we understand how we have been doing that, or do we expect that there will be a new, uh, a new process uh, or, or new standards uh, by which we will have to incorporate housing considerations into our transportation planning? Um, I just, it looks like um, Director Papstorff wants to respond to this one, and I... Yeah, I, I, I will. Sorry, I inadvertently had left my, left my hand up before, um, but I, I will take this. Um, Director Flynn, I think that's an excellent question. Part of this will depend on some guidance forthcoming from the federal government. So again, we wanted to get this in the UPWP so that we are positioned to move right. forward so we can sort of align our resources with the work. Some of the details about how we will fully do this will rely on sort of uh, federal guidance as, as the federal government sort of releases policy guidance to, to assist all of its partners in implementing the law. Um, but we certainly can speak to sort of and, and work um, to describe sort of how we've done that before. Our forecasting, our travel demand forecasting, our work that informs sort of decisions has always taken into account different housing types and housing uh, patterns. Uh, so that's incorporated into the planning process. That way, we have had past efforts um, uh, kind of aligning transportation investments with transit-oriented development initiatives um, at the right. at the local and regional level. So we've certainly made taken steps in the past to sort of connect those things. Um, I believe that this this will prompt us to sort of do that more formally and more directly, and and um, is related to some of the other elements that are already included in the in the unified planning work program around multimodal corridor planning, which we think of as not just transportation corridor planning, but sort of making those land use and transportation right. connections and syncing up our transportation investments, both the type of investments and the priorities of those investments to our broader regional goals, which do under Metro Vision <coughs> include housing. Right, I think this, uh, you know, thank you, Ron. This is exactly, I think, uh, what the Metro Vision wants us to do. 
uh, to be more integrated in our thinking. Uh, that's why I think it's important, uh, Doug, I see your hand is up too, maybe you'll respond to this. That's why I think it's important for a, a future workshop upcoming to, uh, uh, to take a look at how we've done this in the past and how it might look different. In other words, is it possible that as we analyze uh, housing plans and policies in our partner uh, jurisdictions, that some of those might actually end up altering or impacting uh, a, a planned transportation project? Uh, could it change it? Could it alt, you know, modify it? That sort of thing. Uh, thank you. That's all I have. Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I listen. I'm I'm just really excited that we're having a conversation about this subject. That this is to me um, the most I don't I wouldn't say surprising um, section in the new law, but I think we were relieved and maybe. Uh, pretty pretty optimistic about what it means. I mean, listen, we've always known intuitively that there's this strong connection between land use, housing, and transportation, right? I mean, this this is no big surprise. And I think Ron and and Josh did a great job of explaining, you know, exactly how we've related to housing in the past. But this kind of gives us um, new direction, right? And and to Ron's point, we are waiting for guidance to know exactly what that means with regards to housing. I would suggest to you that there's a there's opportunity here to um, uh, you know, develop a regional strategic housing plan um, associated and make sure that our investments in transportation are aligned with that with that plan and to the work that they're doing in, in local governments. Um, the other thing I would like to mention is that um, we are in the process of creating a five year strategic plan for the agency. And we're looking at areas in which we've kind of dipped our toes in the water in the past. And I think housing is probably one of those, but taking a more leadership role in this. And this provides us, you know, some of that some of that um, some of that regulatory direction um, from the feds that that would allow us to spend our our monies in order to staff up and do it so i'm excited about it uh, director levy thank you so much for raising the issue because i think it is truly truly important for this region thank you executive director X. director cook good morning uh, thank you chair <clears throat> uh, I also wanted to ask a couple of questions about the housing provisions um, to the extent we're exploring it and and because we're connecting with housing agencies, it sounds like the major thrust is to focus on affordable or attainable um, housing. Is that a fair assumption, um, Mr. Papsdorf or whoever, or Schwenk? Um, um, yeah. Sorry, Madam, Madam Chair, um, Director Cook, I, I don't know. I mean, certainly it is a focus of this region and is a significant issue in this region, um, but I, I don't think I would say that the federal law that adds this had a particular focus on that that we can discern from the law. Um, there are certain there are new equity considerations um, that uh, in in the law um, and, and uh, coming out in the in the guidance from the federal government. And I think that would be an area where we would focus uh, just because of the regional issue. But I don't believe it's a it's we can uh, it's directly linked uh, necessarily to this federal direction in the law. Okay. Um, would just, you know, remind everybody of that really good study that Chessie Brady did about affordable housing and, and the, the tra transit use and parking characteristics of people who are in affordable housing around transit stations about major around our major investments. Um, but along those lines, then this other question, is there a tail to our transportation planning effect? What I'm getting at is, um, it's kind of ironic because by virtue of the major investments we've made in rail corridors, we'll make in BRT and so forth, um, sometimes the effect is to push out what are already naturally occurring affordable housing. Is there a way that we can either through this process or you know others of your planning um, help to retain and increase the amount of affordable housing around our major investments? Um, Mr. Papster. Yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Director Cook, okay. any other? No, oh. thank you very much. Director Williams. Let me see if I can click on my little buttons to let me join you here. <laughs> um, I, I just want to give 10 fingers up because this has been my platform forever. The transportation is under everything. It's under health care. It's under housing. It's under employment. And I'm tickled pink to see our regional council of governments 
embracing that concept and moving forward as we all have to do to, to realize that if people can't get around, it, they can't live any place. They can't work. They can't stay healthy. They can't get groceries. So thank you all for this. I vote yes, twice. <laughs> thank you, Director Williams. Director Shaw. Thank you. And this kind of echoes what Director Williams had said, why this is such a complex uh, planning um, challenge, I think, um, is because uh, transit has two ends. Um, even if we get um, all of this affordable housing by one end of transit, if your workplace is not anywhere near transit, you're left in a very tough situation. So it is planning so that businesses and hospitals and doctors and grocery stores and retail uh, places are all um, at one, you know, located by the transit as well as housing. I, I think that's the, that's the hardest part, making sure that there is accessibility um, on, you know, to all of the services. Otherwise, <laughs> you know, people are still going to use their cars and therein lies the problem. Thank you. But with that, I would be happy to um, make the motion to Thank recommend, uh, to, recommend um, to the board amendments to the fiscal year 22-23 UPWP. Thank you, is there a second? Director Levy? Yeah, I'll second it. And I, I did have my hand up and down and back up again, just for one final thought. <laughs> if, Wonderful, Director Levy. Yeah, if I could, thank you. Just, uh, and this, this has been great. I'm glad we actually got to talk about it a little bit. And I think what um, what was maybe in, troubling me, and I've, I've heard a little bit about this in the discussion is whether the, the direction that came out of the IIJA suggests that we need to be doing something different than we have been? Um, is it trying to, to trying to urge a different approach to integrating land use and transportation planning? Are there some different outcomes that the, um, that the act is trying to achieve? Um, you know, because I know this has been part of the, the, the process for a long time. And so I, you know, I'm just looking forward to seeing how it gets flushed out and how we can use this new federal guidance and the resources that come with it to try to increase mobility and reduce VMT and create greater equity. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Director Levy. And I just want to recognize that um, Andres from um, Senator Hickenlooper's staff has posted in the chat that there's some information uh, published in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law Guidebook that can help folks with some of the um, interpretation as well. So thank you very much. And thank you to the Senator for um, attending our meetings and participating. We, we really thank you for that. Director Papsdorf. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. And Director Levy, just <laughs> Um, I went back and looked at one of our summary documents of the of the bill in terms of the transportation planning components. Maybe this will this will help get, answer your question directly. So, kind of, I'm not going to read exact bill language, but sort of some summary of some a couple of the components that relate to this. So, um, the bill now requires MPOs to consult with officials that are responsible for housing. Um, adds housing to the scope of the planning process, which has sort of been the focus of our discussion this morning. It encourages MPOs um, that do scenario development. We, we've done that in the past to include sort of assumed distribution of population and housing as a component, which we did when we were doing scenario planning around the RTP. Um, and then, um, and includes affordable housing organizations as interested parties that should have an opportunity to comment on, on a transportation plan. So that encourages us to do more outreach to those agencies that are responsible for affordable housing. So I think that maybe helps bring full circle at least some of this and put a little bit of finer um, uh, 
touch on sort of the conversation we've had this morning. And uh, we really appreciate this dialogue and, and this feedback and we'll come back and talk more about this issue. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, with that, I see no other questions or comments. The motion on the table is um, to recommend this moving forward. Any, any confusion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. And Josh Schwenk, our assistant planner, will take us through the next item as well, which is our 2022 to 2025 Transportation Improvement Program TIP Policy Amendments discussion. Josh, take it away. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Um, so we do have uh, two proposed amendments to the Transportation Improvement Program. Uh, the first would add $30 million in state legislative funds to the I-270 corridor project and would increase uh, the scope of the project from the environmental assessment to also include pre-construction activities, as well as some early action projects. The second uh, would be to add a new project for the I-70 Floyd Hill. Um, this would account for $11 million in state legislative funds. Similarly, the scope for this project is for pre-construction activities and early action projects. And just a note that this is only for the portion of this project within Jefferson County, which is the portion within the Dr. Cog MPO area and therefore must be included in the tip. I'm happy to take any questions on either of these. Otherwise, again, I have a proposed motion available for you on your screen. Any questions from members? I have a question, not seeing any hands come up. Could um... Um, maybe Director Papsdorf or maybe Executive Director X just explain the process so we now have greenhouse <clears throat> gas rulemaking in place and we have a TIP amendment in front of us with two pretty significant, regionally significant projects, obviously. Um, so how does the new rule impact adding new projects to the list like this? Mr. Um, Ron, <laughs> I, I'll start. Um, well, on these particular projects, I know, Ron, you might need to help me on this with regards to I-70 looks, Floyd Hill, I know. And I just oh, want to say, it looks like, it, I also just want to say, it looks like um, uh, Rebecca White from CDOT is trying to be added as a panelist, so she probably would like to weigh in on this as well. Oh, good. She can save me. But it's, it's. Um, I know they've done a greenhouse gas uh, analysis of the Floyd Hill project. Um, and I know with regards to the I-70 um EA that they're conducting, there's uh, there are mitigations that are associated with that project, which are a large component to that project, at least what is being proposed, that will offset um, any, at least theoretically, offset any any greenhouse gas um, increases associated with that project. Um, so I I know I'm I'm kind of delaying here now until Rebecca can get on the line because she would certainly <laughs> have a better understanding than me. I, I can I can at least speak to the to the rule as it was adopted by the commission. So uh, the rule does not apply to tip amendments. It only applies to when we're adopting a new tip. Um, so that's that's one thing. So the rule doesn't apply to this sort of action. Um, but there are require there are specific requirements uh, uh, in Senate Bill 260 of CDOT. Rebecca can speak to those of sort of major major projects and additional analysis and work that CDOT's required to do when they are um, implementing uh, major projects. So hopefully Rebecca is on and she can speak to the, those procedures. Um, I'm here. Oh, good, great. Hi, Rebecca, good morning. Good morning. And I don't think y'all needed me at all. Um, that was a, a great uh, summary of, of how this project in particular fits into the planning process and the greenhouse gas rule. Um, as Ron noted, uh, the rule doesn't apply to TIP amendments. Um, however, this project has been on our radar for a long time, and it will be part of the ultimate analysis that both Dr. Cog will do as part of their plan. Um, CDOT has to model the entire state in order to meet our obligations. Um, and we've been very thoughtful about these requirements um, as we've developed this project, because they've sort of happened in tandem. We've been thinking about Floyd Hill for a long time and doing the environmental work and the greenhouse gas rule has been developed at that same time. And which is why we've built in a pretty significant transit service we're calling Pegasus, which is a um, direct 
uh, response to wanting to, to provide an alternative to folks to travel up this corridor than in a single occupant vehicle, that they will be able to um, ride this new transit service and that will provide a, a greenhouse gas benefit. Um, the other part of our work that Ron sort of alluded to is what we do on the NEPA side of the house, the environmental um, work. Uh, the Senate Bill 260 requirements don't quite kick in for this project because the EA is, is complete. However, um, we have um, done this, this sort of environmentally sensitive look at this project, um, which is why we've included the, the Pegasus service that I mentioned, uh, wildlife crossings, and uh, uh, quite a few efforts to look at the air quality through monitoring, as well as additional analysis. So. I think that sort of covers the landscape there, but I see Ron's hand back up as well. Thank you. And I just have a, a sort of follow on question that I'll just ask now. So in the following up, it, it can get covered. Uh, thank you very much. And I just, I, do, I don't want anyone to think I'm questioning the projects. Obviously these are really important corridors to our region and, and how we improve transportation and mobility through them is critical. Um, I'm just trying to understand the context of the new rule and how that plays into what we do now since it's new to all of us. Um, so my, my follow on question is just sort of, so if we add new projects in as a TIP amendment, does that preclude, since we have a total target we need to hit as a region, does that preclude other future projects from being added in without consideration if we're adding things in one at a time, then when we do the entire TIP, does it make it so that our target, um, we've already taken away some of our capacity on the target number, um, and how can we how can we have that data and information in the future when we're looking at these types of one-off amendments? And so I know um, Director Papstorf, you probably wanted to add on the first part first, but that's my second question as well. Yeah, uh, Chair Spelsman, actually it's a terrific segue to the comment I wanted to make because I think the, you know, one of the questions of members of the RTC might be, well, how can you add two big projects to the TIP and it's not subject to the greenhouse gas rule? Um, and the answer to that is, um, the way the rule structured and the way that our planning process works is that you can't you can't add a project to the transportation improvement program unless it is already included in our regional transportation plan and is consistent with the regional transportation plan. And so these projects are both in the regional transportation plan, uh, which is why they can be amended into the into the tip at this point. Um, and uh, Jacob Rieger will talk to you a little bit later on the agenda about sort of the review process that we're going through of the regional transportation plan um, in the context of com uh, demonstrating compliance with the greenhouse gas emission reduction rule. And so to answer your question directly, Chair Stolzman, if through that process we find that we've got some issues and we can always go back and adjust plans and adjust the tip. And I think particularly because these are uh, largely sort of the precursors, but um, we're going to we're going to work through that process. Um, and then as we develop the next tip, which we intentionally sequenced, if you recall, so that we could get through the RTP review before we opened up a funding call for sort of the most flexible federal funds that we have available uh, to do sort of capacity types of projects. And the first phase we're focusing on air quality improvement and multimodal projects that gives us that time to to do that work and tie all of this together. Thank you very much. Not seeing any other hands on this topic. If anyone would like to frame the discussion with a motion or if anyone would like to ask any other questions, please raise your hand now. Director Stanton. Uh, thank you. Uh, two points. I'd like to make a motion that we consider this. And secondly, uh, we always talk about greenhouse gas but we need to always add in safety because both of these corridors, 270 and Floyd Hill, will, uh, with these improvements, greatly improve safety. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a motion on the table. Um, is there a second? A second. Thank you, Director Flynn. Any other discussion of this topic? Seeing none, the motion is to move to recommend to the board the attached amendments to the 2022 to 2025 Transportation Improvement Program. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Thank you, everyone. The motion carries unanimously. The next um, topic for discussion this morning is the FY 2022 to 2023 Transportation Demand Management Services Set Aside Project Funding Recommendations. Nisha, our way to go manager, is going to tell us about this this morning. Thank you, Chair Stolzman. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Nisha Mukshagundam, the Way to Go Program and Marketing Manager at Dr. Cog. Um, and I'm joined today by Steve Erickson, the Director of Communications and Marketing, also at Dr. Cog. Um, and today I'll be walking you through recommendations for funding through the TDM Services Set Aside Grant. Um, and please be aware that these projects were approved for funding by the Transportation Advisory Committee the afternoon of January 24th, 2022. So the purpose of the set aside grant is to fund local projects that reduce SOV travel. And in addition, these projects should reduce traffic congestion, improve air quality, and overall support better connectivity throughout the region. Um, and for the current round of set asides, the com committee had $900,000 to allocate in addition to $74,000 in returned funds from 2021, giving us a total of $974,000 um, to allocate to projects. And the review panel scored each project application and what I'll walk you through are the recommendations for how to allocate that funding. Um, first, I want to tell you a little bit about the process. Um, the review panel consisted of eight members from Dr. Cog and partner agencies like CDOT, RAC, and RTD. And we also had some representation from CDPHE and Mile High Connects. Um, the panel met to discuss and score projects, ultimately leading to these project recommendations. Um, the process kicked off in September, just to give you a sense of the timeline, and this is when prospective applicants attended a mandatory workshop prior to submitting letters of intent. Applications were due at the end of October, and once all the materials were collected, the panel met to review, score, rank, and ultimately recommend projects for funding. And Dr. Cog received a total of 11 applications. So in the next slide, I'll walk you through the recommended projects, um, but just a reminder, all of these project descriptions are also available in the agenda. So as you can see, the panel recommends for funding eight of the 11 submitted projects. Um, and I will give you a brief description of each of these, but the first project recommended for funding comes from Transportation Solutions. Um, the Pandemic Recovery and TDM Marketing Campaign seeks to empower Cherry Creek and Glendale area employers to offer workplace transportation benefit packages. Um, and this will coincide with many employees at the Cherry Creek Shopping District losing access to free parking, so very timely. Um, and the next project, recommended by the panel was submitted by Community Cycles in Boulder. Um, the Ride by E-Bike program builds on the success of Community Cycles Can Do Colorado funded e-bike program. And this proposed project would provide commuters with long-term individualized support to allow them to more easily commute by e-bike. Next, we have West Corridor's culturally sensitive encouragement and marketing campaigns, um, which target residents in the Westwood, Athmar Park and Val Verde uh, neighborhoods. And this area is on Dottie's equity index, and it's also located within a height injury network. Um, so this proposal seeks to market to residents using Spanish and Vietnamese language marketing materials, how to access safe transportation options and the, and the benefits. Um, the committee also recommends funding a second proposal from West Corridor called the Colfax Safety Outreach Project. Um, and this proposed project coincides with planned improvements along West Colfax, um, and we'll help West Corridor work with business owners along that corridor to help them understand how workers and customers can travel to their business um, during those ongoing improvements. And the next recommended project was submitted by Downtown Denver Partnership, and the Denver Open Streets proposal looks to host eight events over a two-year period uh, meant to educate residents about transportation options in the region. And during these events, local streets would be close to vehicle traffic and open to cyclists and pedestrians. The panel also recommends funding the Aurora Aerotropolis I-70 corridor TDM program development and implementation proposal submitted by City of Aurora and NETC, Northeast Transportation Connections. 
The sponsors look to define a structure for a TDM program that would target workers in this area, um, primarily industrial and manufacturing sectors. And this is a population who is historically underserved by TDM efforts. Next, the panel recommends funding the expansion of B-Cycle Bike Share System Feasibility Study, which is a proposal from Commuting Solutions. Um, and sponsors would like to explore the viability of launching and operating an electric bike share program. And this would serve areas that don't currently have access to e-bike share. And the last project the panel wants to recommend for funding is the Getting There Travel Training Proposal submitted by the Denver Regional Mobility and Access Council or Dr. Mack. The course is designed to teach people how to use the region's multimodal transportation options and will serve immigrant, refugee, and low-income communities. So that concludes the recommendations of the panel. Um, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Uh, thank you, Nisha. Uh, Chair Stolzman had to leave. She was called away to a meeting at Louisville City Hall. So I'll take over chairing the meeting in her place. Uh, do any directors have questions? Director Levy, go ahead. Um, thank you, um, Chair Flynn. I, um, just a question, just for my background. Um, I'm new to this committee, and and this is I'm just starting my second year on the board, and so I'm just seeing some of these um, cycles come through now uh, for the first time. Um, I, so it, I I'm I'm just wanting to understand a couple things that the source of the funding for this, but in in your memo. Um, you say that it's um, that the TDM services set aside is to support marketing outreach and research projects that reduce traffic congestion. Is is it permissible within the source of funding that is used for this to to fund more than just you know the the research and the outreach? Like for example, to actually fund like memberships in a bike share program or things of that nature. Go ahead, Nisha. Thank you. Uh, that, that is a great question. Um, I think there have been some eligibility questions we have sort of gone back um, to, to clarify. And I know there are definitely some, some limitations around what we can and can't use this funding for. So outreach marketing are really those, those uh, pieces that are defined um, within the, the grant. But I do want to turn this over to Steve Erickson and uh, in case he has anything else to share. Yeah, that, th thank you for the uh, the great question. Uh, and uh, just generally speaking, uh, the funding is is uh, surface transportation block grant funding. Um, in previous cycles, it's been CMAC funding, but um, we always have somebody um, on the review panel who's not necessarily scoring, but uh, a representative of Federal Highways, and uh, you know for those kinds of eligibility questions. So generally. Uh, the, the big category that's not typically eligible is, is incentives, but I do think things like um, bicycle um, uh, or uh, yeah, B-cycle memberships, those kinds of things are, are not eligible in this case. It's sort of deemed as an incentive. Could, could I thank you for that? And um, I swear one day I'll, um, I'll understand all of this, but... Um, just a follow up on the you know deemed eligible is that is that uh, in a, is that because of the the source of funds the surface transportation block grant or the CMAC funds or is that some some other eligibility um, source? Yeah, uh, again, great question. It, it is uh, because of the source of the funds, um, and I I believe that um, you know that same restriction on on incentives. Um, uh, is true, not just with STBG, but also C CMAP funding. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Director Williams, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I will be recusing myself from voting on this and wanted that to be in the record based on my um, association with the application. Certainly, thank you. Uh, the recommended motion is to uh, uh, approve the projects proposed by the TDM set aside uh, project review panel to re uh, refer that to the board. Uh, do we have a motion? Um, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to make that motion. 
Thank you. I was I'm sweating that out there. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> uh, do we have a second, uh, Director Shaw? Yes, I second it. Okay. Do you have a question also or a comment? No. no. Uh -uh. Okay. Uh, are there any uh, comments or further questions on this? Seeing none, uh, let me call for the vote. All in favor of this motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. None opposed, any abstentions? Director Williams is abstaining, correct? Thank you. Yes, uh, I am, thank you. Okay, thank you, and motion carries. Thank you very much, uh, Nisha. And, thank you. Uh, let me go back up to the top of my agenda and see what, the, what we have next. Um, item seven, 2022 federal safety targets. Uh, Alvin Bidal Sanchez uh, is going to present on this, I believe. Thank, Thank you. you, Chair. Yeah, take it away. Uh, great. Uh, uh, so as introduced, Alvin Bidal Sanchez, uh, pronouns he, him, his, I'll be discussing our federal safety targets. Uh, so you can go into the next slide, Josh. Thank you. Um, when it comes to our federal targets, there are five performance areas that we actually look at, but we are just touching on the safety targets today, uh, but the remainder fall between the Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration, and they each come with their own guidance as well as their own timelines, uh, data requirements that we're uh, subject to. So I'll go into each of those uh, for the safety piece today. We're required to set targets that apply to all public roads. We do these annually uh, and they apply to the MPO region only, but uh, because we do have aspirational targets through MetroVision, uh, there are obviously regional targets as well that we can set. The data comes from CDOT. They geolocate any crashes that occur on their system. So the roads that they maintain, and then it comes to us and we geolocate the data that's off system. Uh, and then we take some steps just to combine it all and make sure it's all finalized before we make it available on our regional data catalog. There are five performance measures, the number and rate of fatalities, the number and rate of serious injuries, <clears throat> and the number of non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. Uh, the calculation is a little unique, and I'll go into that once we get to the actual target setting process, but this is a five-year rolling average of five points of data. So while we are setting targets in 2022, we are looking at five years worth of data to set those targets. The federal guidance we receive is that these targets, since they are near term, should be realistic, should be achievable, not aspirational. But since we have adopted taking action on regional vision zero, we do have targets and outcomes in metro vision that we're aspiring to. We have pegged our near term targets to our long term aspirations. Uh, as with all of our federal measures, Dr. Cog can either support the state's targets or set our own for the region. Uh, and since these came into effect, Dr. Cog has elected to establish our own safety targets that are specific to the Dr. Cog region. So a reminder of what our MPO area looks like, the area is shaded in green on your map. So Boulder minus Rocky Mountain National Park, Southwest Weld, Western Adams and Arapahoe, Boulder, Broomfield, Denver, and then Jefferson and Douglas County. So this is the area that we receive our data on crashes from uh, and the area that we're setting targets for, but we do have our aspirational targets established through Metro Vision and taking action on Regional Vision Zero for the full region. So uh, we do peg those near-term targets to those. This is gonna be our fifth round of setting safety targets. So we wanted to provide a snapshot of what uh, the achievement status looked like for our previous rounds of targets. Um, while we are in 2022, we are still processing 2020 data. So we're not able to show you whether we've achieved those fatality, serious injury or non-motorized targets yet. Uh, and we don't expect to receive 2021 data until the later half of this year, but we did provide an estimate uh, that we have with the best available data on hand right now of the fatalities that we did experience in the region in 2020 and 2021. So you can see uh, an increase, unfortunately, in 2021 of 306 fatalities that we expect to see borne out through the data once we receive that and process it later this year. We've taken a number of different actions uh, as an agency since these uh, targets came into effect and to prioritize safety as an uh, important aspect of our planning process. Some of the new ones that are on this slide from last year include the adoption of our Regional Complete Streets Toolkit. We now have an adopted regional transportation plan that explicitly includes safety investments over 600 million towards those types of investments. Our TIP has almost over $900 million towards 118 projects that improve safety. 
We've conducted a slow speeding campaign. We've hired our first dedicated safety planners. We're excited for her to take over our safety program and help us achieve our safety outcomes. Uh, we were involved in a, peer, a planning peer exchange with other MPOs across the nation that are at the forefront of safety planning as well. We've been involved in CDOT's Region 1 and Region 4 bike ped safety studies. And a little recently, we've also been identified as a focus area through Federal Highway's focused approach to safety. So we have access, priority access to additional trainings, additional workshops, uh, data collection, uh, support from the Federal Highway Administration to help us in our safety outcomes. Getting into the target setting, I mentioned that the targets are a five-year rolling average. So when it comes to setting our zero fatalities by 2040, you're looking at an average reduction of 13 fatalities every year to get us to zero fatalities by 2040. We take the fatalities that were recorded in 2018, 2019, and our forecast 2020, 21, and 22, add all those up and divide by five to actually get our fatality target. So while we do, we hope to see reductions every year in fatalities, uh, you'll see that the actual targets that we're setting might not correspond to that 13 fatality reduction on our following slides. Serious injuries are also a five-year rolling average. So again, we're looking at the crashes that resulted in serious injuries, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022. So again, we're adding up those serious injuries and dividing by five to set our serious injury target. Uh, when it comes to serious injuries, we're looking at achieving zero by 2045. And then our last number target is the non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. This is a combination of zero non-motorized fatalities by 2040 and zero non-motorized serious injuries by 2045. Uh, again, it's a five-year rolling average. So while we do want to see those reductions moving forward, we're still taking into account five years worth of data as we set these targets. So. 2018 through 2022 divided by five. These targets are also included in your memo. You'll notice the number of fatalities, number of serious injuries, and number of non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries are those same targets that were on the previous slides. Um, when it comes to our rate targets, we take into account the VMT that has occurred in the region. So we just uh, take those numbers, divide by five as well. So that's where our rate targets come from, just taking into account the VMT we've experienced in the region in our calculation. The TAC recommended approval back in January. Uh, we'll be going before the board tomorrow as well. Uh, and this is all to meet our federal deadline of the end of this month to turn in our documentation to CDOT to meet our federal requirements for these safety targets. Uh, we do expect 2022 to be a relatively busy year when it comes to our federal performance areas. So we do expect to come back before y'all relate with targets related to infrastructure conditions, so bridge and pavement, as well as system performance. So traffic congestion, CMAC, um, travel reliability. So those are just a heads up as we get into the year, we do expect to be coming back before y'all with additional targets in addition to the safety ones we brought before you this morning. The requested motion is to move to recommend to the board the 2022 federal safety targets and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, any directors have questions? On this, I have one just to clarify. Uh, could you explain uh, what is included and what might be excluded from a non-motorized uh, fatality or serious injury? Yep, you're really just looking at uh, any the crashes that occur, pedestrian, bicycle. Um, I'd have to go back into specific definitions, but it's just anything that uh, results right. in a fatality or serious injury for a person biking, walking. Okay, I'm uh, curious. Is also included in that. Right. Okay. I, I'm curious if that would include motorized, like scooters that are motorized, yep. uh, would be included in non-motorized, perhaps? Right. I think the the uh, effect of non-motorized is just um, people outside of their motor vehicle. So okay. uh, while the outside scooters might be, yep, okay. while the scooters might be motorized, they're not at the speeds that you would expect for, for okay. motorized motor right. vehicle traffic. Thank you, much appreciated. Uh, seeing no other questions or comments, would a member like to uh, make a motion? So moved, Director Williams. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Kelly Cook. Thank you, Director Cook. <clears throat> uh, no further comments or questions. All right, uh, all in favor of uh, moving to recommend this to the board, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. Any abstentions? Seeing none, uh, the uh, action is approved and this will go on to the board. Thank you uh, very Thank much. You. I believe the next item is the, uh, let me go back to my, oh, it's an informational briefing from uh, uh, Jacob Rieger, long-term uh, transportation planner on uh, RT RTP amendments updates. Jacob, you're on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, we did just want to give you an update on the work that we're doing uh, related to the greenhouse gas rulemaking and our revision of the 2050 regional transportation plan. Um, so I think back a meeting or two ago, we presented sort of generally <clears throat> excuse me, kind of the process that we've been going under and some of our requirements, just to refresh that really briefly, as you all know, um, after two years of work, we adopted our 2050 regional transportation plan back in April um, of last year. And then with the rulemaking that was adopted, uh, the GHG rule that was adopted in December of last year, we now have an October 1st deadline of this year um, to revise the regional transportation plan and to demonstrate um, that the plan as revised meets the emission reduction targets for greenhouse gases uh, for several time periods, uh, 25, 30, 40, and 2015 um, that are contained within the new GHG rule. So we have begun that work. Um, as part of that work, we also did, um, as we typically do between major plan updates, what we call a uh, kind of cycle amendment uh, for project-based amendments to the transportation plan, uh, recognizing that since we do major updates every four years, uh, we typically each year do this kind of you know cycle amendment in the sense that giving project sponsors a chance to uh, make updates to their projects if something you know significant has changed around uh, the scope of the project, the cost, um, or the air quality staging period time frame um, in which these projects are located within our our thirty year transportation plan. Um, so Josh, if you'll scroll down to the table, this is in your packet. This is attachment one. I'm not going to go through these individually, but we wanted to be transparent and show you. Um, the project-based amendments that we received. Uh, we did a solicitation that opened in mid-December of last year, closed in mid to late January of this year. Um, so these are all of the sort of amendment requests that we received uh, from project sponsors. They include both CDOT um, and local government project sponsors. So we just wanna report these out to you. Again, I'm not gonna go through these individually unless you have questions. Most of these are um, actually sort of, um, Many of these are requests to change the staging period in which these projects are located in the plan. Um, so in particular, <clears throat> excuse me, um, many of these are requesting to uh, projects that were in the later staging periods in our 30 year plan, actually requesting to move these projects up. Um, so we're looking at these from both a GHG lens, of course, but also any time that we amend or update the plan, we also look at these from our typical uh, federal requirements of which there are many, uh, but in particular, we're looking at air quality conformity um, and fiscal constraint, which is the notion of sort of cost feasibility. Can we afford uh, the projects that are in the plan and can we afford um, to make changes to projects in the plan, either if a project cost has changed or if we're moving projects forward or backwards within the plan, because our plan is fiscally constrained, not just for the entire 30 years, um, but it's constrained actually by five-year periods, but certainly by staging periods. So when we move a project, advance a project or delay a project in a staging period, we're actually changing the fiscal constraint there as well. And we wanna make sure that frankly, the numbers pencil out. So where we are now is we're in the process of reviewing these amendments, kind of understanding their implications from both our typical federal requirements. And then we'll soon be starting our GHG analysis. Um, as I've shared with you, I think the last time we met about this, um, according to the GHG rule, we start with the baseline um, and the way that's defined in the rules that we look at our plan as adopted last April. And that's what we're about to do um, in the next few weeks here is start to look at the plan as adopted to see kind of where we're starting with our GHG emission reductions for the plan as a whole. And I want to make that point. It's not project based. It's cumulative, you know, sort of the entire plan, our fiscally constrained plan that includes all of our investments that are that are incorporated within the plan. So we start first by understanding where the adopted plan is, um, establish that baseline that helps us understand how close or how far we are from meeting the emission reduction targets by timeframe. Um, and then from there, we're gonna start looking through based on the effect of these amendments, um, potential other tools that we have in the toolbox, understanding you know, how, you know, what the gap is in terms of meeting our emission reduction uh, targets and then um, what strategies we have available um, to help us get there. So that's really where we're at in a nutshell. Again, this is not an action item today. We just wanted to report out kind of where we're at and the project-based amendments we've received. 
Uh, but I'd be happy to take any questions on this. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Director Shaw, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Jacob, um, these show things moving ahead on the timeline. Are there things that were moved out of the 20 to 2029 timeframe and put off till later? Yeah, so you're right, Director Shaw, of the, of the amendments that we received, any of the amendments that, that involved moving a project involved moving the project up. So advancing a project from say, you know, the 2030s to the 2020. And again, that's part of what we're looking at is to understand first the federal sort of requirements around that, um, particularly around fiscal constraint, eventually for air quality conformity, and then we'll move into a GHG analysis associated with that. We did not receive any request um, in this cycle to move any projects back. I will say that, again, we, we have, a, and I've presented on this before to you all, I think that, you know, think of it as sort of a hierarchy or a pyramid of strategies that we have available to us. Uh, many of those strategies involve things that we could do in our traffic model, um, other sort of, you know, sort of straightforward things. But one of the things that's on the table, and we don't want to preclude anything as, as we're at the beginning of this process, but if we needed to, as we get in deep into the GHG analysis, if we needed to um, look at the project mix and potentially make changes to a project, whether it's moving another project up or moving a project back, um, that is one of the tools in the toolbox. So while that was not, um, while that was not requested um, in terms of our amendment process, that is something that's available to us if we need it to help us meet the emission reduction requirements. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Sorstein, go ahead. Yes, hello, good morning. And um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, Jacob, could you um, indicate what in the, um, the cost values in the columns, what, what the unit is? is, it in millions of dollars? Yes, it is. And so my eye goes down to the South Platte River Trail for $50 million, what does that get us within the city of Denver? So as we understand the project and currently that's what's in the plan as adopted last April, was a $50 million to make improvements to the South Platte River Trail. My understanding of that project is to both close a few gaps that are associated with it, but really to improve the trail that that's there, to make it a wider trail, a better trail, um, given obviously the amount of traffic and, and use of that trail, um, to improve the, the user experience along the length of the trail. The amendment that's being requested here is that um, as adopted in the plan, the trail was in our 2030 to 39 staging period. Uh, the city of Denver feels like that they can do part of this work sooner. Um, and they've requested to split the project into two equal pieces. So $25 million would actually move up to the 2020 to 2029 staging period to do that work sooner. Okay, great. Yes, it just, it's just incredible how much things actually cost. And when I compare that to you know, some of the other projects that seem so um, expansive. Um, it's things are expensive no matter what we do, aren't they? That's true. Thank you. Certainly, it, it is. It's amazing, isn't it? Incredible. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you very much, Jacob. We, uh, we talked about this internally in the Denver team yesterday. I'm, Federal Boulevard BRT going through my council district with a welcome, a welcome move to see that advanced uh, into the current staging period. Uh, seeing no other questions, I think the next item is uh, other matters uh, by members. Do members have any uh, matters to bring up to the uh, committee? Seeing none, I see that the next item is just to note that our next meeting will be uh, four weeks from today. Uh, March 15th. And seeing no other business, I'll give it a count of three. One, two, three, no other business. Um, and thank you, Shelley, for that comment uh, in the chat. Uh, seeing no other business, this meeting will be adjourned and uh, we'll see many of you tomorrow evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe. Thank you. Okay.